Hello, I'm here with Caitlin to talk about confidential computers and other things. Yes. And the amazing thing to me is confidential computing. So the the register has an article about this. This is the future of targeted advertising. And I read that headline. I said, what? But confidential computing is where you have something like a, a trusted execution environment, a secure enclave, where you do some computing in that special chip so it can't be seen by the main processor so it's safe and this is typically done for things like hard drive encryption but now they're going to use it for confidentiality and here's how it works your company is not allowed to examine your health data but they want to target ads based on your health data so they put your health data and personal information in the confidential computing environment and do calculations and outcome the tags to target ads and they can say they didn't look at your data so that, that lets them dodge regulation. That does not sound <laughs> very convincing. It's confidential. They found how to target the edge without exposing your confidential data. So like basically what you're saying is that it, if the computer gets your data, they don't look at it before, they get the data, and then all of a sudden the computer says, you know, so-and-so needs... Um, psychiatric medication for schizophrenia mm -hmm. um they haven't technically looked at your 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 medical data and can't do anything that would invade your privacy yes i think this is very much like google's frequent um claims that they've anonymized your stuff like when they people first started finding out google tracking about 15 years ago they said oh we anonymized it we took away the last bite of the ip address and we left the cookies in that'll be okay right and then occasionally they come up with another bogus claim to have anonymized it. Oh, geez. You, you don't sound convinced. <laughs> no. But they're hoping they can convince the regulatory agencies yeah. that this counts as not exposing your data. Yeah, especially with modern AI that can sort of work backwards in large quantities. I, I no, no, this is not convincing at all. Some people are just hard to please. All right. Well, you've got that secure boot thing, which is pretty hilarious. Holy cow. Yeah, well, actually, before I talk about that, I, I, I want to mention I'm a little tired. Oh, good. Uh, because I was up pretty late last night <clears throat> testing out that uh, telescope back there, which oh. is uh, which is relatively small. I mean, I'm it's it's a 73 Six. millimeter. Go on. Six inch or what is it looks like? No, 73 millimeters. So it's like two two inches of two to three inches of of diameter. Of, oh. of the aperture so that's all it is and i pick it up i can take the whole thing with the tripod with the equatorial mount pick it up with the battery which is charging on the floor back there kind of on the floor i don't know if you can see it mm -hmm. anyway i can pick up the whole thing take it outside um and i'm in i'm near san jose in the bay area which is one of the most light polluted areas in the united states and now i've done a lot of astronomy before in this environment and I, you know, and, and I have bad vision. So if people have told me that the telescope is like looking at Andromeda and I just believe them, you know, like if, if you say so. Um, and so, you know, to me, you know, spending a lot of money on telescopes is kind of a silly idea here in, in Bortel eight, nine skies, but uh, with modern CCD technology, uh, you can sort of, bypass a lot of the restrictions that would normally be required previously. So instead of, for example, having a large light bucket, a large aperture to take in a lot of light at once, uh, the camera can, for example, take a five minute exposure. So it gets a lot of light in and it's like 80% has 80% quantum efficiency, which means that 80% of the photons that hit the sensor get registered. So you essentially turn this small light bucket into a big light bucket. <laughs> and uh, so what you can then do, and and I do want to point out that I, I am still putting this uh, telescope together. So it does not have like a finder scope. It doesn't have the light pollution filter that I'm waiting for and a few other things, but the skies were too perfect last night. And so I decided to try it out. And sure enough, that right there is the pinwheel galaxy. Uh, which is in the uh, Big Dipper, near the Big Dipper. Uh, and even without all the equipment that I'm going to need, I still managed to image it and 
see it, which is amazing. Like I said, this is some of the most light polluted skies ever. <laughs> you and you've know, got I, a mo you've got a clock drive to follow the sky. Yeah. So the equatorial mount, the way it works, is that it's a, a direct drive harmonic. It's a harmonic drive, um, and when you set it up outside, uh, you have to point it toward the celestial pole, which is in in our case in the northern hemisphere. That's near Polaris. Uh, pretty much Polaris. Uh, but it's actually really cool because it's, once again, it has a camera that's a computerized camera. There's a, a computer attached to the side of the equatorial mount. Uh, so it will look at the, you, you just point it roughly north. And then the computer will say, okay, I'm roughly north. Cool. Uh, let me, you know, rotate around a, a little bit. Okay, perfect. Uh, now I will take a picture of all the stars and do a plate solve. So instead of having to like manually try to figure out, like do a three point, you know, trilateration or something, it just looks at the stars and says, am I pointing at the celestial, you know, pole or not? And if it's not, it'll say, you have to move up one degree this way, three degrees, you know, to the right or something. And you just, you know, turn the dials, get it locked on. And you're set. It's that simple. You can you can do a polar alignment within a minute or two. It is absolutely amazing with modern technology. So, no, it sounds great. And the, the pinwheel galaxy looks like you can see it has two arms there, right? Uh, it has a lot of arms. Um, it is. Uh, yeah, there's. Yeah, it kind of looks like there's two arms. I don't know how many arms it specifically has. Uh, if you look I at think... like Hubble, if you look at Hubble images, it's it's really a. Uh, a site to see yeah but I, I mean i was just reading an article last week where they said okay. that the milky way they've decided has only two arms instead of four yeah, yeah i well. think the the pinwheel might have four maybe wait no one they said most of them in fact have only two anyway yeah, probably only two i don't know okay. anyway but yeah there it is it's yeah uh, and and like i said this is uh, highly high light polluted skies and this is 20 million light years away yeah very nice there it is yeah Anyway, uh, back to the articles. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, which one are we talking about? The mic Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft, yes. Uh, so yeah, this is pretty bad. Um, Microsoft put out, uh, had seen a bug, right? There. Uh, so this is by uh, Ars Tech. This is an article by Ars Technica, written by Andrew Cunningham. And uh, there was some malware called the Black Lotus uh, Boot Kit. And it uh, bypassed some of the secure boot protections within Windows. And Microsoft is going to have to patch it uh, to make sure that, that this malware doesn't spread. But in patching it, old Windows ISOs will no longer boot. Uh, so essentially, if you have something like a Windows Server 2016 install or even a Windows 10 install or Windows 11 install, uh, on a disk or, or a USB, it will no longer boot on future systems, which and, is- it, And your backup and your restore disk. And your restore disk, everything, like it will no longer boot. Basically, micro, basically what's, what's happening is Microsoft has to revoke some secure boot keys, which are you know, required for Windows to boot. And so, yeah, if you, and I know people that really love old version of Windows and they're always installing Windows 7 and upgrading to Windows 10 and all this stuff. Um, and that is going to become a big issue moving forward. So this is one of those cases where security is really going to be painful uh, for a lot of end users. And, you know, one day they're, they're going to install an update and their computer will no longer boot from their backups or their uh, install disks. So. Yeah. And well, one thing I've heard is you can turn off secure boot and get all that to work as long as you're willing to have no protection against this malware. Which is usually what I do for virtual machines. Yeah. And when I install Linux, I mean, secure boot is is nice, um, but I, I feel like it's almost, I don't know. I mean, it prevents boot kits and root yeah. kits. Uh, but how often do people get hit, like just average consumers get hit with boot kits and root kits? I don't know. Um, it's a it, 
huge deal on Paul Security Weekly. He's an expert on secure boot and talks about it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I'm just focusing on this. But but when I ask that question, I don't get much of an answer. Like how many real attacks are using this right now? Yeah, especially because a lot of systems have secure boot on by by default. So it's not a particularly great attack vector. Um I mean, obviously, you should have it on if you're like in the government sector or you're dealing with, with you know, important data. But if you're running like a virtual machine or like a home machine, it's probably not. It, you know, if if secure boot is causing headaches, it might be worth it to to turn it off. I'm saying this as a security professional. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think I, yeah. yeah, I tend to agree. It'd be for high value targets like yeah. government and military or something. Yeah, like encrypting your hard drive. Like, yeah, encrypting your hard drive. Is really important if you are at a you know government position. You're working with sensitive data that might be confidential and or you know whatever. Uh, but for average consumers, should the average consumer encrypt their hard drive? Well, maybe Pro- they should if they're carrying a laptop on an airplane. Maybe, maybe. But I would argue that encrypt. I, I've had systems that were completely unrecoverable because the users got paranoid and decided to encrypt everything. So we couldn't like reset the password. We couldn't get in. We couldn't restore the data. I mean, that's what you're missing out on. So, so if you encrypt the, if you encrypt your hard drive, and something goes wrong, you can't go in there and and get your data back, right? Right. Um, And so sometimes these security measures are more of a hassle than they're they're worth to certain end end consumers. They're definitely worth it if you are, you know, you're dealing with some sensitive stuff. But yeah, well, you know, all of this is Microsoft struggling once again to catch up with what Apple did like 15 years ago with the with their iPhone, where it has encrypted secure boot. They've been you're talking about implement, they tried to implement this on Windows 8 on the arm. They've been trying to catch yeah. up with that, not making it. And the problem with, with Microsoft is that they, they really want to turn Windows into the iPhone, I've noticed. And that is such a bad idea. Well, there's no malware on the iPhone, which is a really good feature. They would like to have that. It, well, there is malware on the iPhone. I mean, come on. It's really minimal. You really don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, most people don't have to. But at the same time, you know, the value of, of running something like Windows or, or Linux come from its openness, which does invite a certain amount of malware. But, you know, if you like, I know Microsoft really wanted to lock down Windows so you could only get stuff through like the Microsoft Store. And that would have yeah. been an Just absolute, like the iPhone. It, that would have been an absolute disaster. Yeah, well, I bet 90% of users would be content with it. They're content with Macs and iPhones, although most of them turn off that feature on the Mac. Yeah, I mean, but, e- even with Mac, people don't just get stuff through the App Store. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a fair cop. Yep. All right. <clears throat> anyway, um, I found an article on someplace called sciencealert.com that talks about racial bias in facial recognition systems. And it had something I'd never seen before, a uh, video poem about this from 2019, where this woman just shows all the major AI systems, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Google, and somebody called Face, which looks like maybe Chinese, that they, um, she shows them a picture of Sojourner Truth, of Michelle Obama, of other famous black people, and it identifies them as male, as having a mustache, there it identifies their hair as a coonskin cap. He said it really is appalling. And uh, this, I think, is why a lot of people are very, very nervous about facial recognition. And I, uh, it's a minefield, but it is extremely clear that it totally messes up on black skin and they really need to have better training data. So everybody is rushing out these new AI machine learning models. And I wonder to what extent they've actually fixed this problem. I don't know. I know there the Bloom model, which um, is the small one you can run on your own free instance in Google Collab. I got it working a few days ago. That one is sex biased. If you ask it to complete a sentence, the man went to work and and the woman went to work and it will give you a stereotyped answer. So uh, that model, but that's not a cutting edge model by any means. Hopefully the big ones like uh, ChatGPT and Bard and everything are getting better at this. Anyway. Um, you've got guilt trips. Guilt tips. Guilt oh. tips. Yes. Yeah, so we've all seen tip inflation, um, where you go everywhere now. And, and so during COVID, 
people remember that, you know, people were putting their lives at risk to go to work. And we were all happy to give these poor people who had to, you know, put their lives at risk to go serve coffee or, you know, do groceries and stuff, an extra tip, because you know what, you know, they, that, that's, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, that makes sense. Well, they got very used to that. And all of a sudden, everyone was like, we need more tips. That's what we need. We need more more money. Um, and now that the pandemic is pretty much over, uh, the, the, the tipping has continued. <laughs> and it's gotten out of hand. And a lot of people have noticed this. You know, you go to a restaurant and you can pay, you know, 20, 30%, 35%, you know, tips as like default options. Um, you go to like McDonald's and they want you to tip too. Um, how bad has this gotten? Well, if you go, Gizmodo has this article by Kevin Hurler uh, talking about self-checkout aisles. Um, and so basically, if you, if you go to a self-checkout aisle in certain stores, uh, they will prompt you for a tip, even though you're not interacting with anyone, you're doing your own service. Uh, they want a tip. And, and I mean, you wouldn't even... You don't even tip grocers usually, even though they're like packing your stuff for you. You usually don't do that. It's usually reserved for like restaurants. Uh, but now, if you're if you're doing your own um, uh, groceries or you're you're packing your own bags, it'll ask for a tip. And what's what's really bad is that they the the way it's usually presented is that you'll it's not like an optional. Would you like to add a tip? Yes or no? They usually you you'll you'll pay for your your item. And then it'll say, how much do you want to tip? You know, 15%, 20%, or 25%. And then you have to like specifically do like no tip, <laughs> like, you know, because it makes it seem like it's expected when it when it really should not be, and it really isn't. And it's gone to the point where even even things where I used to be like, okay, this is a, a tipping situation, um, unless people are and I want other people to to go along with me on this. Unless people are actively serving you, meaning you know they're like Uber drivers, or you know you're you're at a restaurant and not being ignored, you know they're they're you know giving your food and taking care of you, like just don't tip. That's all I can say. Just just put zero percent. Don't feel guilty about it. This has gone too far. So even at Starbucks. I've gone to the point where I'm just like, you know, 0% tip. Yeah, no, you're, this is like McDonald's. This is like. Um, so this is know. bigotry. You're suggesting that the computers and AIs are inferior to humans and don't deserve your compassion. Exactly. Exactly. I am bigoted towards AIs and computers. And also, I just noticed this while I was uh, browsing the webpage. There is a yeah. um, sequel to something we covered earlier on the podcast uh, a long time ago. Uh, this is on the same website obviously gizmodo this is by uh nikki main and this was just posted 30 minutes ago uh but the there was this guy who intentionally crashed an airplane uh called trevor jacob and uh he recently just pleaded guilty to that so that's yeah yeah we, we all knew that he intentionally crashed his plane it was pretty in, obvious in order to make a youtube video in order to make a youtube video which is ridiculous like like, how do people have that much money and time to like and and put people's lives in danger in order to like get a few clicks? What? Well, there are influencers making a lot of money, just like rock bands. There are a few that actually make a lot of money. And these people are, of course, hoping to make it up there. I guess. Yeah. Anyway. All right. All right. And uh, I was very interested to see this one. Um Again, this is from SciTech Daily. I didn't know this. Now, nearsightedness is growing rapidly in children. They say in a few decades, 50% of all the people will be nearsighted. And uh, I was nearsighted. And I remember when I went to grad school in physics, one of my grad students went around and he interviewed people. And he said, I've interviewed like 130 grad students and professors, and 100% of them are nearsighted. And then there was a guy who did research like 30 years ago where he took chickens and put them in small crates so they would focus on nearby objects and they all became nearsighted. So I said it is caused by reading all the time at a close range instead of being out in the fields looking at things that are like 30 feet away. And the constant focusing nearby puts pressure on your eye and makes it stretch. The back moves out, which is why you're nearsighted. But this I never heard of until now. There are new lenses which help prevent this. 
Um, they treat nearsighted with lens, but they only focus as sharply in the middle. And then it has some kind of different focus on the periphery, which somehow prevents your eye from degrading so rapidly. It prevents your nearsightedness from increasing as much. Because I remember mine, I need new glasses every year or so growing up. And then when I got to be maybe 25 or 30, my, my eyes seem to reach some kind of equilibrium. But aha, um, uh -huh, good. Anyway, so it's very interesting. And the interesting thing about this is apparently clinical data has proven that these lenses delay the development of nearsightedness. And now they're developing laser technologies to measure and perfect these strange lenses to prevent that. So it sounds like a great thing. It may help people in the future. And uh, by the way, I think it might be related to migraine headaches, which is another thing an awful lot of uh, academics that read all the time get. Well, they don't mention that in the article. I think the two are connected. Migraine headaches are closely connected to vision. Anyway, um, and you've got a drive through Yeah, so TechSpot has an article written by Sean Knight uh, about our jobs being taken away by AI and our, our best jobs nonetheless, being a Wendy's drive through worker. <laughs> um <laughs> which is what we all want, which is how we all dream of becoming. Uh, but Wendy's is taking the dream away by replacing the order, the drive through order talkers uh, with AI chatbots, which is actually, I think, a really good use of AI technology. Um, and yeah, so this is this is the first time we're, we're, we're really seeing the service industry being replaced with with AI, which is really the only thing of, of note here. But it, it is it is of note and something we should be taking note of. And you're probably not going to want to tip them. And you will not want to tip them. No, I do. Don't tip at Wendy's. Don't tip at McDonald's. Don't tip at Starbucks. Some <laughs> don't, people don't oh. don't tip 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 at when you go to a restaurant and you're being served tip there tip your uber drivers your taxi drivers no one else well you know i am um, i always am sort of skeptical of this claim that ai is going to take jobs away but i realize i'm in a privileged position ai gives me more work teaching ai classes so i'm not the average worker that's going to lose their job from ai i'm gaining my job from ai yeah i ai is not going to replace all our jobs um but it will take away jobs that people don't want to do um particularly like wendy's orders um <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah i think the real issue is we need to take care of people we need more uh, social safety net so yeah. that people aren't so desperately needing a job that they would take any crummy job because it's so horrible not to have one yeah and, and i mean and based that's how our economy functions like like there i know there's some people i've heard it argued like, and i have no idea why they they think this is a good argument that people would do jobs you know even in, even if they didn't get paid or didn't have to work you know to to survive or whatever and there are just certain jobs that people just don't want to do right like well, sure yeah there, there there are jobs that will never be taken away by ai like teaching because teaching is you actually need to... oh go on it's on the list. It's number two expected to die because of AI. They all say, well, they just have AI doing all the teaching yeah. and we'll see. It won't because anyone who's done any real teaching knows that um, it is not just about ex you know, exposing students to knowledge. You also have to make a emotional connection with them on some level. And AI just can't do that. You know, uh, I wonder, I just... My, my private contracting class is teaching secure coding in a corporation just won an award for the most innovative security training. And it's nothing different than what I do at City College, but apparently it's different. They, ju they just have a crummy <laughs> app, which I wrote. They, they find the vulnerabilities in it and everybody is super happy. And I'm like, what did you have before this? Isn't that the <laughs> obvious way to do this? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that is the way to, to, to teach, um, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, if you were going to teach, especially like a STEM subject, then then having something set up like an adult version of Montessori, where you have yeah tools set up for the students to use and play with and then figure out. So in, you know, having an app that you find all the vulnerabilities with. Uh, right now, I, so I've been at Amazon for a few months now, many months, almost, it, I mean, about half a year, a little over half a year. 
And I'm realizing now that I really do need to learn AWS if I'm going to be doing security at Amazon. So well, yes. AWS is huge. There are so many huge. services. Yes. Yes. So, so I, in fact, I just booted up my first EC2 instance um, a few oh. days ago. So, you know, I'm. Well, I've taken a few Amazon training classes and just sort of been horrified at how much yeah. stuff there is. So many security features. Yes. Charge, I, I, and they all cost money too. Yeah. And and I have, I, ha I mean, to my credit, I did take some AWS courses before, but they didn't have, actually have me do anything. They were like oh. sans courses where you just attend and take a test. I mean, that was, oh. and that you don't learn anything from that. Well, I right? went to the Amazon courses and they give you like a $50 credit and they give you some workshops where you spin yeah, up yeah. some things and turn on the stuff. Yeah. So anyways, there's this great site, um, that was recommended to me by my coworker, uh, Bobby Rausch. I want to give him credit. Uh, that it's called flaws.cloud. I'm giving my coworker credit, not the creator, but <laughs> flaws.cloud. But flaws.cloud and flaws2.cloud, which is exactly like what you said, Sam. It is um, a, a series of websites that are hosted on AWS, and they just say, go hack us. Um, and it is fantastic training for AWS. Oh, this looks great. It is. It's absolutely great. So like the first one, for example, they have their website hosted on an S3 bucket, which you can do. Yeah. And if you do, like, if you get on the AWS CLI, you know, prompt, you can do, um, if you do dash dash, you know, uh, no client cert or something like that. Uh, you can just list all the items on the S3 bucket, you know? So, yeah, open S3 bucket, the number yeah. one flaw. Number one flaw. Yeah. Uh, and then they have like EC2 instances where they have like snapshot backups that you can access if you have an AWS account. So you make a copy of their snapshots, you know, attach it to your machine. Well, that's great. <laughs> I okay. mean, it is it, it's fantastic training. I'm learning so much about AWS doing the flaws. Cloud. Anyway, uh, you know, this is what students asked me for is a cloud security class. Yes. Then I decided a machine learning class is even more important, but both are really important. But but they're very important. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm I'm going to be spending probably the next month doing nothing but AWS cloud stuff because I really need to get this stuff. People are, are also, they hear I work at Amazon and they're expecting me to be an expert on AWS. <laughs> so I, at this point, I just, I just need to do it. I need to sit down yeah. and spend a month yeah. just doing cloud, cloud, cloud. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Um, so that'll be, yeah, that, that's a big project, but anyway, where were we? Oh yes. AI chatbots taking away our jobs. Yeah. So yeah, human, human, you know, stuff that requires an emotional connection isn't going to be taken away. Uh, stuff that requires a human touch is not going to be taken away. Um, but it will make our, our lives easier. So like, for example, I know there's a lot of contention about AI art, but I've talked to a lot of artists that are incorporating AI art into their art. So instead of having the AI paint for you, what you can do is you can collaborate with the AI. So like, for example, like if you're doing a highly detailed scene, you can have the AI generate parts of the background for you. Then you can tweak the back parts of the background as, as needed, move it around, you know, and, and that's, that's where I think this AI is going to be really useful is, is is when you are working on jobs, you can have the AI um, sort of create content along with you uh, to assist you in creating content, not do the content for you. So I do a lot of writing. And so I found that ChatGPT is a great proofreader and can suggest changes and stuff like that, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, now, you don't want it writing for you, uh, but if you know how to write with it and use it as a tool, um, it can be highly beneficial. And this is, you know, it, and, and ideally we do want AI taking away jobs that no one wants to do because no one should feel forced to do jobs. And we do want to automate our economy so that we can create an economy that sort of runs itself essentially. Uh, so then people are free to do the jobs that they want to do or just get, you know, like universal basic income and lounge around all day reading Harry Potter. I don't know. I don't know what people, normal people do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think we should exploit any new development to its fullest potential. AI should do whatever it can do yeah. and humans should do whatever comes after that. That way we all have more products and services out there cheaper. Exactly. Exactly. I'm, I'm all in favor of AI taking our jobs, including my job. I mean, if AI can do my job better than me, 
AI should have my job. Yeah. And I, I can, I can, I can always find something else to do. I can always pivot to something else. But we know. do need, but we do need to change our society. So people yeah. who lose their job are not ruined like exactly. they are now. Exactly. Yeah. We, we need, we need something like universal basic income. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's not just a, it's not just a liberal, oh my gosh, you know, everyone deserves, you know, screw that. We just won't have enough jobs. Well, I mean, I like, it, yeah. I like that study we were talking about, I think last week where it, they said, you know, we tried this in someplace like Finland, all these homeless people, give them homes. And you know what happens? Everything gets a lot better. You save yeah. money, they're healthier, they get a job. Everything is so much better if you actually take care of people instead of letting them die in the street. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really funny. They found that uh, I was, there were some studies a long time ago, and, I, and I, I'd, I'd have to look them up, that show that the best way to fight poverty is to give poor people money. <laughs> yes. And you think, you think they'll blow it, but that's not true at all. Like 80% of them would just love to, you know, pay their essential stuff so they can like get a better job or something. Yes, exactly. And, and that's, that's the problem. So when, when you are like, we live in, we live near San Francisco and, and if we go downtown, we will see the Lord, the, the mass of homeless, uh, drug addicted, crazy people. Um, and that's how we see that that's to us is what homelessness looks like. The, the, the reality of homelessness is that those people are a very small percentage of people who are poor and or homeless. Most people who are poor and or homeless don't look poor and, and or homeless. They, they blend in with the rest of society. Uh, so, you know, yeah, those, you know, 20%, 10%, 5%, whatever. It's probably been less than 5%. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the small percentage of, of people that are poor and homeless because they're addicted to drugs and everything like that. Yeah, they'll blow the money. They'll get drugs, whatever. And that that's something we're going to have to deal with. They but, need more than money. They need like uh, counseling yeah. and stuff. Yeah, they need counseling. They need a safe place to do drugs, particularly away from San Francisco downtown, please. Yeah. Uh, um, but... You know the, but the vast majority of people, if you just give them money, they'll pay their bills. They'll go to college. They'll, you know, do. They'll they'll invest. Um, you know. Yeah. Well, anyway, the last thing I want to say is is something that a friend of ours sent me, and I put it as my background. I didn't know this. The Adobe Building in downtown San Jose has a game on it. It has this semaphore thing up here. These four things rotate. Each one of them has four positions. So it traces out a byte, four to the fourth, and it rotates about every five seconds and plays a, a note you can hear or sound on the internet. And it's a puzzle and it takes years to solve. And so there have been, there's now in the third puzzle. The solution for the second one is amazing. It had been broad. Every position is a byte. Every byte codes to a character. And it had been paying the entire text of Thomas Pynchon's 1966 novel, The Crying of Lot 49. But it had been playing it one paragraph at a time. And each paragraph came with a preamble, which contained a prologue, which was always the same, followed by a seven-letter key, which was a seven-letter word chosen from James Joyce's Ulysses. And that key led to a Vigonaire cipher of the rest, which is, you know, the famous... Uh, couple centuries old almost unbreakable cipher so it's uh, he had carefully designed it not to be too difficult so it could be solved but i think it took like three or four years for the last one to get solved so that's pretty interesting i didn't know that and yeah. i guess you'd have to to record everything it did for hours it seems like you'd pretty much have to make an automated device recording it to uh even to get the input data yeah, you you would have to go out there with a camera, video camera, record it for a it's while. It's on the web. You can yeah. tune in on the web. You yeah. can see it. So you could probably write some kind of scraper for that web page. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm not planning to do it, but I think it's very charming. It is. It is very cute. But I think the uh, the flaws cloud thing looks far more interesting. <laughs> as something yeah. to to actually do. Yeah, flaws are cloud. I can't recommend it enough. I'm going through it myself. Yeah. Um, and then after flaws, uh, Hack the Box has an entire AWS environment yeah. to go through. So I've done just a couple of those challenges. I need to learn a lot more about it. Yeah. Yeah. AWS is just a gigantic kraken. <laughs> yeah. And their command line interface is interesting. And Google has their own similar one, the Google Cloud yeah. command line interface. Yeah. Yep. All right. 
Well, that's it for this one. I'll have another one on Tuesday.